I'm Jenny Taylor Martin, a director here at Edgar Casey's ARE. Today I'm speaking with the author of Divine Visits, Josie Varga. Josie, it's so nice to have you with us today. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure. Divine Visits features real stories of divine encounters and interventions. What made you write this book? I have a friend named Tony, and Tony was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. She called me to tell me that she found out she had cancer, and of course I was upset, and we were praying for her. And shortly after, she had uh, to go to another hospital and have the tumor removed. She went to have the tumor removed, um, surgery went well, um, but something happened when she was recovering. Um, this is what she told me afterwards. What happened was she was recovering from the surgery and she remembers being woken up. She wakes up, Jenny, and looks around the room and figures, oh, I must be dead, and goes back to sleep, closes her eyes. Again, she remembers being awoken a second time, opens her eyes, oh, I must be dead, closes her eyes again. The third time, she feels a warm tap on her shoulder, opens her eyes and sees a man who she said resembles a picture of Jesus that she has in her home. So she looks at this man and she said he looked like he was wearing a white doctor's lab coat. And for some reason, she said to him, what nationality are you? I mean, why she would wake up and ask this man, what nationality are you? I don't know. And, and she, did, she had no idea why she did either. But she said, what nationality are you? And she said the man looked at her and said, I am Israeli Jew. And to this, she looked at him and said, well, you have the most beautiful eyes I have ever seen. At this point, he bends down, kisses her twice on the forehead, and says, you are healed. Well, Tony didn't tell me about this. Uh, she came home from the hospital. She was recovering. And about two months later, she had to go back to visit her oncologist to see where she stood with her cancer. She goes to the doctor and she says, you know what, I want to send thank you notes out to the people that helped me. And she mentions this doctor, the Israeli Jew. And to her astonishment, the doctor looks at her and says, there is no such doctor. Uh, I don't know what you're talking about. There's no such doctor that fits that description. What's more, the test results come back and her oncologist says to her, Tony, Go home and pretend you never had cancer because she was completely cancer free. Completely yeah. cancer free. So that day she comes home, she called me to tell me what happened and I was, I was so ecstatic. I mean, I was so happy. I, in many ways I felt like it happened to me. And I was scheduled to speak at the ARE. It was like a week or two later I was scheduled to speak at the ARE. And I said to her, would you mind if I share your story with the audience? And she said, sure, go ahead. And my point in telling the story was to explain the power of prayer. So I'm at the ARE, I'm sharing my story, and I noticed this woman in the audience listening to me intently. I mean, she looked like she was hanging on my every word, and I noticed her. So I'm, I complete the speech. And afterwards, I'm signing copies of my books, and I noticed the attentive woman purposely standing in the back of the room. Well, the line dies down, Jenny, and she walks up to me, and she goes to say something, but she breaks down in tears. She couldn't say what she was gonna say, and I'm thinking, oh my God. So I came from around the table, I hugged her, and I said, what's wrong? Tell me what's wrong. And she said, Josie, do you remember that story you told about the woman with cancer? And I said, yes. She said, I was just diagnosed with breast cancer, and your story has given me hope. Mm -hmm. Well, then, I cried. Mm -hmm. She cried again. We hugged. Divine Visits was born on that night at the ARE mm -hmm. because I realized that if I could give one woman hope with that story, I could surely help many more with the book. So Divine Visits was born on that night. You have your own cancer story that you shared in your book. I sure do. Uh, ironically, I'm in the midst of completing Divine Visits. 
and I'm scheduled to go for a mammogram. So I go for the mammogram and I get one of those letters in the mail and it said, Josie, you have to come back. You have to have a second level ultrasound. Typically, Jenny, that does not concern me because I have dense breast. So I'm always being called back for a second mm -hmm. level ultrasound. However, this letter said that they saw something on the left side. Mm -hmm. So was I concerned about that? Yes, absolutely. So I go, I schedule another mammogram and the second level ultrasound. I get the mammogram done and now I'm in the x-ray room with the technician and I notice that she is spending, you know, special attention to one spot on the left side. I mean, she kept repeatedly scanning this one spot. Did I know I was in trouble? Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, and all of a sudden she looked at me and she said, Josie, I'll be right back. I have to go talk to the doctor. She left me alone with my thoughts, mm -hmm. and I'm laying there, and I'm thinking, oh my God, you know, this is not good. So, intuitively, I said, God, is everything okay? You know, in my mind, I said, is everything okay? And I heard back, clear as day, no. I'm thinking, wait, no? What do you mean, no? You know? <laughs> so again, I said, is everything okay? Again, I heard back, no. So at this point, I'm really scared. I mean, I want to jump off that table. You know, I want to run out of that room. I mean, I'm, I'm laying in this room, you know, topless. Where am I going to go, you know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um, now I decide, well, I am going to make a plea to God. So I, I don't remember my exact words because I was so distraught, but I said something like, well, God, if it's not okay, you have to fix this because I'm in the middle of finishing my book. You know, <laughs> I have young children. I can't go yet. I can't die yet. You know, you can't take me yet. And then immediately after that, I thought of my godmother, Lucy. Now, let me just explain a little bit about my godmother. My godmother was a wonderful person and she was extremely, extremely religious, okay? She believed in God, she believed in the angels, she believed in the saints, she would go to uh, church every Sunday to the point where when I was little, I would say, Lucy, if anybody is going to heaven, it's you. So when you get up there, make sure you put in a good word for me. And we would laugh. Mm -hmm. So I think that's why you know, I thought about her uh, that day. So I said, Lucy, if I ever needed you, Lucy, I need you now. Please, Lucy, help me. Now imagine I'm in a dimly lit room, I'm laying on a table, and all of a sudden, right after I said that, within mere seconds, this bright white orb descended from the ceiling. I'm laying there and I'm looking up and I see this orb and I'm thinking, oh my God, you've, you've lost it, you know. <laughs> what, what, what's going on here? So I close my eyes, I rub my eyes, I open my eyes again, and the orb is still there. So now I'm laying there, I'm watching it, and it's slowly descending toward me, okay? It gets to about four inches above my chest and stops. And at this point, this peace and calm comes over me. And I realize, oh my God, something incredible, something divine is taking place here. And then it moved to my right. And when it, it was about here, and it stopped. And I see it, and telepathically I said, it's okay, come to me, I'm not afraid. And I put my hand out to the orb. And remember, the orb is white. It's got little rays of light protruding out of it. It is not transparent, and what I mean by that is I cannot see through it. But I reached out to the orb, and when I did that, the center of the orb formed a little purple dot. And the purple dot got bigger and bigger. So I'm laying there and I'm looking at this and I'm totally like mesmerized by the magnificence of this. And all of a sudden the technician walks in, breaks my trance and boom, the orb disappears. So she continued with the scans and of course, I'm not thinking about her, I'm not thinking about the scans, I'm thinking mm -hmm. about what just happened to me. And I'm wondering, how am I going to tell people what just happened? How am I going to tell my family? How am I going to tell my husband? You know, who's going to believe me? And then I quickly reasoned, well, I don't care. I don't care who believes me because I know what happened. So 
About two days later, I get a phone call from my OBGYN, and he said to me, Josie, there's something on the left side that should not be there. You have to have a biopsy immediately. Don't wait. And I could hear the panic in his voice. Mm -hmm. And I hung up the phone, crying. So I scheduled the biopsy. And while I was waiting for the day of the biopsy, I busied myself finishing divine visits. And in the book, um, there's a medium named Loy. And Loy answered a question of mine. And in response, she said something very interesting. She said, Josie, very often when the spirits of our loved one manifest, she said, if you were to see them, you would either see hazy smoke or orbs of light. Mm -hmm. So Jenny, I read it and I reread it. You would see hazy smoke or orbs of light. I was like, oh my God, because that's what I saw in that room. I saw orbs of light. So I decided to tell her what happened and I contacted her and I said, you know, this is what happened. I cried out to God, I cried out to my godmother. And she said, Josie, when you cried out to your godmother, she was there for you. She pulled through for you. So Lori confirmed what I was thinking, that it was my godmother that came through. While I have the biopsy, and of course in my mind, because of what Lori said and because of my experience in that room, you know, I'm, I'm thinking that everything going to be okay, you know, uh, mm -hmm. but, still you, but still you worry. So then two days after getting the biopsy, I get a phone call early in the morning from the doctor and he said to me, Josie, I had to call you. He said, the results came back benign. He said, I am shocked because it looked like cancer. I thought it was cancer. Now, I start sobbing on the other end. Mm -hmm. I mean, I start sobbing. And he's on the other line saying something like, no, 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 no. I'm telling you this because you should be happy. And I said something like, yes, I know, thank you, and hung up. How do you explain to that doctor what happened in that room? How do you explain to that doctor that you believe your fate was changed? Now remember, when I was in that room, I said, is God, you know, God, is everything okay? I heard back, no. Mm -hmm. I said it a second time. God, is everything okay? I heard back, no. Why would I hear no twice mm -hmm. if everything was okay? Right. Why would I hear no if it was originally benign? So, week after that, I had an appointment with my regular OBGYN for a checkup. And I basically said to him, so, they thought it was cancer, huh? It didn't, it didn't look good, huh? And he looked at me and he admitted, well, yes, that's what he was told. So at this point, I decided, well, I'm going to tell him what happened in that room. You know, if he believes me, fine. If he doesn't believe me, fine. But I'm going to tell him what happened when I was in that room. So I told him the whole story. And he was just like looking at me, open mouth, like he couldn't believe what I was saying. And he said, Josie, there are things in life that we cannot explain but let's just be happy, you know, let's just be happy that this happened. So um, it's just very ironic to me mm -hmm. that in the midst of completing a book about angelic and divine encounters, mm -hmm. I would experience a divine intervention of my own. So yeah. I, I feel totally blessed. There are divine encounters with angelic beings and then there are spirit guides. What's the difference between the two? I get that uh, question um, all the time. One of the things that St. Augustine said, St. Augustine was a great Catholic mystic, and one of the things he said is, an angel is not an angel because of his nature. An angel is an angel because of his office. What does that mean? It means that an angel is an angel because of what he does, because of his deeds, right. not because of his makeup, which is spirit. So. In answer to that question, I think they all do the same thing. They, they are all helping people, okay? Spirit guides help people. Angels help people. So you have um, different levels. You have the highest levels, which include angels like Archangels Michael or Archangels Gabriel, all the way down to the spirits who once walked among us and, you know, on earth and now help to, you know, work to help people in human form. So I don't think that the 
is a difference other than that. I just think that they are different levels. Mm -hmm. You also talk in the book about humans coming to the aid of others, but uh, how does that work with divine encounters? Okay. Uh, very, very often, uh, I believe that those on the other side can solicit the help of us on this side to help their loved ones. Um, let me explain what I mean. I started a group on Facebook based on my book, Visits from Heaven. The group was only up about two weeks. Um, my point in starting the group is I wanted to give people a place where they could go to read about other, you know, the experiences of others, know that they're not alone, know that love never dies, you know? Mm -hmm. So the group was only up about two weeks. And this woman named Lisa posted a story about her son, Richie. Now, Richie, unfortunately, committed suicide. So mm -hmm. she was talking about the death of her son. And she said two months after his death, she wanted to go see a psychic medium. So she went to a medium named Glenn Klausner. Now, Glenn Klausner, coincidentally, is in Visits from Heaven. And Glenn told her that her other son, Jason, was going to sustain a Christopher Reeve type accident, okay? Two months after that, which is like July, I believe, they decide to take their deceased son's car out, okay? And before they leave, they check the key for the gas cap to make sure it works because it needed gas, okay? It worked fine. They get to the gas station. All of a sudden, it doesn't work anymore. The gas cap, for some reason, doesn't open. Mm. So she's baffled, and they go into the glove compartment searching for a second key. And when they go into the glove compartment, they see a document sticking up, and on that document is a shiny penny. So she takes the document out, looks at it, and it's a, it's a document uh, that her son had gotten from a church. Before he passed, he had joined, joined some church and accepted Jesus into his life, okay? Well, while she's, you know, moments after she reads this document, the gas cop spins open, on its own, just spins open. She's telling the story, all right? Now remember, Glenn Klausner told her that her other son was gonna sustain a Christopher Reeve type accident. The following month, her, husband, her son was doing choke holds, okay? Um, he was doing jujitsu, I believe, okay? And he sustained an injury to his neck. He tore mm. the main artery in his neck. He could not talk, he could not eat, he could not do anything, okay? But she remembered what Glenn Klausner told her, and she felt, well, he said everything was going to be okay, so she was at peace. And within four weeks, miraculously, remember he couldn't, his eyes were rolling mm -hmm. back, he couldn't do anything, couldn't walk, couldn't eat, couldn't swallow, and within four weeks he was back to normal. Wow. Okay, so she posted this story in my group, and for some reason, Jenny, I can't stop thinking about this penny. And I'm thinking, now you know, pennies are often used as a sign for my loved ones on the other side. Sometimes, typically, uh, you know, they'll send a penny in the year of their birth or in the year of their death. So I'm reading this and I can't stop thinking about this penny and I decide, well, let me try to get a hold of her. My thought was, well, if I could see if she still has the penny, and if she does, I'll tell her to take note of the date. Mm -hmm. So I asked her to contact me. She did, and um, I was traveling at the time. She contacted me via email. I was traveling, and I said to her, listen, I'll contact you later when I get home. So that evening, me and my husband and my two daughters are watching TV, and all of a sudden, the electricity goes out. Well, we went up for five seconds, so it was really quick. We didn't think anything of it. Put the girls to sleep, and I said to my husband, I'm gonna go downstairs to the office. I said, I have to send out an email. He said, okay. So I went downstairs, and I wrote up an email for Lisa, and gave her examples of how our loved ones use pennies as a sign, and asked her if she you know, still had that penny. I get towards the end of that email, electricity goes out again. Mm caused me to lose what I wrote. I had to reboot the computer. But feeling like I needed to get this message to Lisa, I just started typing it up again. I get towards the end of the email again. The electricity goes out a oh third time. <laughs> so now I am mad. So literally, I said out loud, 
okay, I guess you don't want me to send this email out tonight. Okay, I get it. And I just went to sleep. The next morning, I get up with Lisa on my mind. Mm -hmm. And I feel like I have to get this message to her. Why? I don't know, you know, but I just intuitively knew I had to get this message to her. So I go, I type the email again, and this time, no problems, electricity didn't go out again. I send her the email, and a short time later, I get a response back. She thanked me, and she said, I'm going to check the date, thank you. Shortly after that, she writes, oh my God, you are not going to believe this. She said, the penny is 1975. That is the year her son, Jason, was born. Mm -hmm. He was the one who was injured and had, you know, tore the mm -hmm. artery in his neck. Mm -hmm. And I, I said, well, and I was, I was amazed that my intuition was correct, but I had this feeling that there was more to it, okay? The next morning, I get an incredible email from Lisa, um, an email that would prove to me that our loved ones are still looking after us, and that love truly, truly never dies. Um, what happened was, after she got my email, she couldn't shake off the feeling that something was going to happen to her son, Jason. So she kept trying to contact him. She contacted her son and he told her, her mom, you know, everything's okay. And she said, what are you doing? And he said, well, I, I'm working. and I've got to uh, get to an electrical panel on the roof. So she says to her son, well, you know, this, is, this just happened. I spoke to this woman named Josie Varga, and she tells him about my story about the pennies and the email and whatever, and tells him to be careful. Well, what happened next is amazing. What, what happened was her son then proceeds to go on the roof, is walking across this old tin roof, and as he's walking, he sees a shiny penny. Oh, dear. Now, <laughs> Because of what she said to him, and, you know, yeah. the story about me and the penny and everything, he bent down, Jenny, to pick up that penny. And when he bent down to pick up that penny, he saw that the rafters were split just ahead of him. He said, mm -hmm. had he taken one more step, the roof wouldn't have been able to support his weight, and he would have fell through the roof. Wow. So she sends me an email explaining this. And she said, thank you, Josie. You may have just saved my son's life. So can you That's imagine yeah. how I felt? I mean, I was blown away. Mm -hmm. I was crying um, and, and feeling very honored, you know, that I was used in, in such a way. But it gets better. So <laughs> um, I couldn't shake that off. I kept thinking about it. And I really wanted to talk to Lisa. So I wrote her and I said, do you mind if I call you tonight? So we were, you know, she said, sure. And I called her that evening and we talked about what happened. And she said something about an electrical panel. And I said to her, wait a second. I interrupted her conversation mm -hmm. and I'm yelling into the phone. I'm like, Lisa, wait a minute. What does your son do for a living? What does he do for a living? <laughs> and, and she says, um, he's an electrician. And I went, Lisa, my electricity went out three times the night <laughs> I tried to send you that email. So we were both just stunned because we realized that Isn't it was her something? son that was keeping me from sending that email out. And Lisa told me several times that it would not have had the same impact had I sent that email to her on Sunday than Monday. You know, right. so it had a bigger impact on her Monday. So mm -hmm. she truly believes that it was her son keeping me from sending that email out. So yes, our loved ones do help us from the other side. Yeah, that's amazing. And they use humans at times, like Absolutely. you were used. That Casey would have said that you were being a channel of blessings probably to <laughs> that yeah. family. Uh, you so. know, and what's amazing, yeah, they use humans all the time, but sometimes we don't even realize it. Sometimes right. they, they put us in the right place at the right time, mm -hmm. and we are helping other people, but we don't even realize mm -hmm. it. That's the, that's the amazing part. Yeah. And Casey also talked about divine encounters. Uh, did you want to share something? Sure, sure. Um, 
Elder Casey spoke about angels all the time. He spoke about mm -hmm. uh, encounters he had with angels mm -hmm. even as a young boy. And he said that we should all be very mindful when we entertain strangers because we might be in the presence of angels and not even realize it. Mm -hmm. But what I find uh, very interesting about Echo Casey is he said that as time went on, he said more and more people would seek spiritual knowledge. More and more people would seek spiritual guidance. And he said that spiritual forces, which include angels, would become more active in humankind, prompting a global spiritual awakening. Mm -hmm. Well, Jenny, look around you. Yeah. Okay? It is, it is happening right now. More and more people are seeking spiritual knowledge. More and more people want to know about the afterlife. More and more people want to know about after death communication, uh, near death experiences. Um, turn on the TV, okay? There are, are more mm -hmm. shows about the paranormal than ever before, yeah. and including radio shows. So I find that very interesting, and I think that we are actually in the midst of Edgar Casey's predictions right now. Mm -hmm. What do you hope readers will get from your book? When I set out to write Divine Visits, I wanted to give people hope. I wanted people to understand that miracles are not just something you read about in the Bible. Angels are not just something you read about in the Bible. Uh, miracles are happening every day. They're happening all around us. The divine yeah. is all around us. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what I hope that people understand, that it's, it's not just a thing of the Bible. It's actually real. It's very real, and it's happening all around us. That's great. Thank you so much for being here. It's Thank been a you. pleasure. Divine Visits is published by Fourth Dimension Press, an imprint of ARE Press, and is available at arecatalog.com.